Crossing the fields in the gloaming, I came up with some children, each with a tin bucket of milk, threading their way towards Stratford. The little girl, a child ten years old, having a larger bucket than the rest, was obliged to set down her burden every few rods and rest. So I lent her, lent her a helping hand. I thought her prattle in that broad but musical patois and along these old hedgerows the most delicious I ever heard. She said they came to Shottery for milk because it was m much better than they got at Stratford. In America they had a cow of their own. Had she lived in America then? Oh yes, four years, and the stream of her talk was fuller at once. But I hardly recognized even the name of my own country in her innocent prattle. It seemed like a land of fable. All had a remote mythological air, and I pressed my inquiries as if I was hearing of this strange land for the first time. She had an uncle still living in the States. State of Hua but exactly where her father had lived was not so clear, in the States somewhere and in Ogden's Valley. There was a lake there that had salt in it, and not far off was the sea. In America, she said, and she gave such a sweet and novel twang to her words, we had a cow of our own and two horses with a wagon and a dog. Yes, joined in her little brother, and nice chickens and a goose, but, continued the sister, we owns none of them here. In America, most everybody owned their houses, and we could uh, own a house if we had stayed. What made you leave America, I inquired. Cause my father wanted to see his friends. Did your mother want to come back? No, me mother wanted to stay in America. Is food as plenty here? Do you have as much to eat as in the States? Oh, yes, and more. The first year we were in America, we could not get enough to eat. But you do not get meat every often, very often here, do you? Quite often, not so confidently. How often? Well, sometimes we has pig's liver in the week time, and we owls all meat of a Sunday. We like meat. Here we emerge from the fields into the highway, and the happy children went their way, and I mine. In the evening, as I was strolling about the town, a poor, crippled, half-witted fellow came jerking himself across the street after me and offered me him, offered himself as a guide. I am the feller that showed Artemis Ward around when he was here. You've heard on me, I expect? Not? Why, he characterized me in punch, he did. He asked me if Shakespeare took all the wit out of Stratford, and this is what I said to him. No, he left some of them, some for me. But not wishing to be guided just then, I brought the poor fellow off with a few bought the poor fellow off with a few pence and kept on my way. Stratford is a quiet old place and seems mainly the abode of simple common folk. One sees no marked signs of either poverty or riches. It is situated in a beautiful expanse of rich rolling farm country, but bears little resemblance to a rural town in America. Not a tree, not a spear of grass. The houses packed close together and crowded up on the street, the older ones presenting their gables and showing their structure of oak beams. English oak seems incapable of decay, even when exposed to weather. While indoors, it takes three or four centuries to give it its best polish and hue. I took my last view of Stratford quite early of a bright Sunday morning when the ground was white with a dense hoarfrost. The great church, as I approached it, loomed up under the sun through a bank of blue mist. The Avon was like glass, with little wraiths of vapor clinging here and there to its surface. Two white swans stood on banks in front of the church, and without regarding the mirror that so drew my eye, preened their pl plumage while farther up, a piebald cow reached down for some grass under the brink where the frost had not settled, and a piebald cow in the river reached up for the same morsel. Rooks and crows and jackdaws were noisy in the streets overhead and about the church spire. I stood in a long while musing upon I stood a long while musing upon the scene. At the birthplace of the poet, the keeper, an elderly woman, shivered with cold as she showed me about. The primitive homemade appearance of things, the stone floor much worn and broken, the rude oak beams and doors, the leaden sash with the little window panes scratched full of names, among others that of Walter Scott, the great chimneys 
where, where quite a few family could literally sit in the chimney corner, etc., were what I expected to see, and I looked very human and, and looked very human and good. It is impossible to associate anything but sterling qualities and simple, healthful characters with these early English birthplaces. They are nests built with faithfulness and affection, and through them one seems to get a glimpse of devouter, sturdier times. From Stratford I went back to Warwick, thence to Birmingham, thence to Shrewsbury, thence to Chester, the old Roman camp, thence to Hollyhead, being intent on getting a glimpse of Wales and the Welsh, and maybe taking a tramp up Snowdon or some of his congeners. For my legs literally ached for a mountain climb, a certain set of muscles being so long unused. In the course of my journey, I tried each class or compartment of the cars, first, second, and third, and found but little choice. The difference is simply in the upholstery. And if you are provided with a good shawl or wrap-up, you need not be particular about that. In the first, the floor is carpeted and the seat substantially upholstered, usually in blue woolen cloth. In the second, the seat alone is cushioned, and in the third, you sit on a bare bench. But all classes go by the same train, and often in the same car or carriage, as they say here. In the first class travel the real and the shoddy nobility and Americans. In the second, commercial and professional men, and in the third, the same with such of the peasantry and humbler classes as travel by rail. The only annoyance I experienced in the third class arose from the freedom with which the smokers always largely in the majority indulged in their favorite pastime. I perceive there is one advantage in being a smoker. You are never at a loss for something to do. You can smoke. At Chester, I stopped overnight, selecting my hotel for its name, the, Great, the Green Dragon. It was Sunday night, and the only street scene my rambles afforded was quite a large gathering of persons on a corner listening apparently with indifference or curiosity to an ignorant, hot-headed street preacher. Now I am going to tell you something you will not like to hear, something that will make you angry. I know it will. It is this. I expect to go to heaven. I am perfectly confident I shall go there. I know you do not like that. But why his hearers should not like that did not appear. For my part, I thought for the good of all concerned, the sooner he went, the better. In the morning, I mounted the wall in front of the cathedral and with a very lively feeling of wonder and astonishment walked completely around the town on top of it, a distance of about two miles. The wall being in places as high as the houses afforded some interesting views into attics, chambers, backyards, etc. I envied the citizens such a delightful promenade ground, full of variety and interest, just the right distance too for a brisk turn to get up an appetite or a leisurely stroll to tone down a dinner, while as a place for chance meetings of happy lovers or to get away from one's companions that the flame must burn in secret and in silence it, it is unsurpassed. I occasionally met or passed other pedestrians, but noticed that it required a brisk pace to lessen the distance between myself and an attractive girlish figure a few hundred feet in advance of me. The railroad cuts across one corner of the town, piercing the walls with two very carefully constructed archways. Indeed, the people are very choice of the wall, and one sees posted notices of the city authorities offering a reward for anyone to detected in injuring it. It has stood now some seven or eight centuries, and from appearances is good for one or two more. There are several towers on the wall, from one of, from one of which some English king, over 200 years ago, witnessed the defeat of his army on Roten Moor. But when I was there, though the sun was shining, the atmosphere was so loaded with smoke that I could not catch even a glimpse of the moor where the battle took place. There is a gateway through the wall on each of the four sides, and this slender and beautiful but blackened and worn span as if to afford a transit from the chamber windows on one side of the street to those of the other is the first glimpse the traveler gets of the wall. The gates beneath the arches have entirely disappeared. 
The ancient and carved oak fronts of the buildings on the main street and the enclosed sidewalk that ran through the second stories of the shops and stores were not less strange and novel to me. The sidewalk was like a gentle upheaval in its swervings and undulations, or like a walk through the woods, the oaken posts and braces on the outside answering for the trees and the prospect ahead for the vista. The ride along the coast of Wales was crowded with novelty and interest, the sea on one side and the mountains on the other, the latter bleak and heathery in the foreground but cloud-capped and snow-white in the distance. The afternoon was dark and lowering and just before entering Conway we had a very striking view. A turn in the road suddenly brought us to where we looked through a black framework of heathery hills and beheld Snowden and his chiefs apparently with the full rigors of winter upon them. It was so satisfying. It was so satisfying that I lost at once my desire to tramp up them. I barely had time to turn from the mountains to get a view of the Conway Castle, one of the largest and most impressive ruins I saw. The train cuts close to the great ground, round corner tower and plunges through the wall of gray shelving stone into the bluff beyond giving the traveler only time to glance and marvel. About the only glimpse I got of the Welsh character was on this route at one of the stations, Abel, Abergel, I think, a fresh, blooming young woman got into our compartment occupied by myself and two commercial travelers, bagmen, or as we say, drummers, and before she could take her seat was complimented by one of them on her good looks. Feeling in a measure responsible for the honor and good breeding of the compartment, I could hardly conceal my embarrassment, but the young Abergelist herself did not seem to take it amiss, and when presently the jolly bagman addressed his conversation to her, replied beseemingly and good-naturedly. As she arose to leave the car at her destination, a few stations beyond, he said he thought it a pity that such a sweet, pretty girl should leave us so soon, and seizing her hand, the audac audacious rascal actually solicited a kiss. I expected this would be the one drop too much, and that we should have a scene, and began to regard myself in the light of an avenger of an insulted Welsh beauty when my heroine paused, and I believe actually deliberated whether or not to comply before two spectators. <clears throat> Certain it is that she yielded the highwayman her hand, and bidding him a gentle good night in Welsh, smiling, smilingly and blushingly left the car. Ah, said the villain, these Welsh girls are capital. I know them like a book, and have had many a lark with them. At Hollyhead, I got another glimpse of the Welsh. I had booked for Dublin, and having several hours on my hands of a dark, threatening night before the departure of the steamer, I sailed out in the old town tilted up against the side of the hill in the most adventurous spirit I could summon up threading my way through the dark, deserted streets, pausing for a moment in front of a small house with closed doors and closely shuttered windows, where I heard suppressed voices, the monotonous scrapings of a fiddle, and a lively shuffling of feet and passing on finally entered, drawn by the musical strains, a quaint old place, where a blind harper seated in the corner of a rude kind of coffee and sitting room was playing on a harp. I liked the atmosphere of the place so primitive and wholesome, and was quite willing to have my attention drawn off from the increasing storm without and from the bitter cup which I knew the Irish sea was preparing for me. The harper presently struck up a livelier strain when two Welsh girls, who were chatting before the grate, one of them as dumpy as a bag of meal, and the other slender and tall, stepped into the middle of the floor and began to dance to the delicious music, a, Wel a Welsh mechanic and myself drinking at drinking our ale and looking on approvingly. After a while, the pleasant, modest-looking barmaid, whom I had seen behind the beer levers as I entered, came in and, after looking on for a moment, was persuaded to let down her sewing and join in the dance. Then there came in a sandy-haired Welshman, who could speak and understand only his native dialect, and finding his neighbors affiliating with an Englishman, as he supposed, and trying to speak the hateful tongue, proceeded to berate them sharply, for it appears the Welsh are still jealous of the English. 
But when they explained to him that I was not an Englishman, but an American, and had already twice stood the beer all around, at an outlay of six pence, he subsided into a sulky silence and regarded me intently. About eleven o'clock, a policeman paused at the door and intimated that it was time the house was shut up and the music stopped, and to outward appearances his fellow friendly warning was complied with, but the harp still discoursed in a minor key, and a light tripping and shuffling of responsive feet might occasionally have been heard for an hour later. When I arose to go, it was with a feeling of regret that I could not see more of this simple and social people with whom I at once felt that touch of nature which makes the whole world kin, and my leave-taking was warm and hearty accordingly. Through the wind and the darkness, I threaded my way to the wharf, and in less than two hours afterward was a most penitent voyager and fitfully joining in that doleful gastroloquial chorus that so often goes up from the cabins of those channel steamers. I hardly know why I went to Ireland except was to indulge the few drops of Irish blood in my veins and maybe also with a view to shorten my sea voyage by a day. I also felt a desire to see one or two literary men there, and in this sense my journey was eminently gratifying. But so far from shortening my voyage by a day, it lengthened it by three days, that being the time it took me to recover from the effects of it. And as to the tie of blood, I think it must nearly all have run out, for I felt but few congenital throbs while in Ireland. The Englishman at home is a much more lovable animal than the Englishman abroad. But Pat in Ireland is even more of a pig than in this country. Indeed, the squalor and poverty and cold, skinny wretchedness one sees in Ireland and what freezes our sympathies, the groveling, swiny shiftlessness that pervades these hovels no traveler can be prepared for. It is the bare prose of misery, the unheroic of tragedy. There is not one redeeming or mitigating feature. Railway traveling in Ireland is not so rapid or cheap as in England, neither are the hotels as good or as clean or the fields so well kept or the look of the country so thrifty and peaceful. The dissatisfaction of the people is in the very air. Ireland looks sour and sad. She looks old, too, as do all those countries beyond seas, old in a way that The American is a stranger to. It is not the age of nature, the unshaken permanence of the hills through long periods of time, but the weight of human years and human sorrows, as if the earth sympathized with man and took on his attributes and infirmities. I did not go much about Dublin, and the most characteristic thing I saw there was those queer, uncomfortable dog carts, a sort of Irish bull on wheels, with the driver on one side balancing the passenger on the other and the length and the luggage occupying the street of safe, seat of safety between. It comes the nearest to riding on horseback and on a side saddle at that of any vehicle traveling I ever did. I stopped part of, my, of a day at Malo, an old town on the Blackwater in one of the most fertile agricultural districts of Ireland. The situation is in the situation is fine, and an American naturally expects to see a charming rural town planted with trees and filled with clean, comfortable homes, but he finds instead a wretched place, smitten with the plague of filth and mud, and offering but one object upon which the eye can dwell with pleasure, and that is the ruins of an old castle, Mallow Castle, over Blackwater which dates back to the time of Queen Elizabeth. It stands amid noble trees on the banks of the river, and its walls, some of them 30 or 40 feet high, are completely overrun with ivy. The black water, a rapid amber-colored stream, is spanned at this point by a superb granite bridge. And I will say here that anything like a rule, town in our sense, a town with trees and grass and large spaces about the houses, gardens, yards, shrubbery, coolness, fragrance, etc., seems unknown in England or Ireland. The towns and villages, all remnants of feudal times and seem to have been built with an eye to safety and compactness, or else men were more social and loved to get closer together than now. Perhaps the damp, chilly climate 
made them draw nearer together. At any rate, the country towns are little cities, or rather it is as if another London had been cut up in little big pieces and distributed over the land. In the afternoon, to take the kinks out of my legs and quicken, if possible, my circulation a little, which since the passage over the channel had felt as if it was thick and green, I walked rapidly to the top of Cockmill Down Mountains, getting a good view of the Irish fields and roads and fences as I went up, and a very wide and extensive view of the country after I had reached the summit and improving the atmosphere of my physical tenement amazingly. These mountains have no trees or bushes or other growth than a harsh prickly heather about a foot high which begins exactly at the foot of the mountain. You are walking on smooth, fine meadowland. When you leap a fence and there is the heather, on the highest point of this mountain and on the highest point of all the mountains around was a low stone mound which I was puzzled to know the meaning of. Standing there, the country rolled away beneath me under a cold, gray November sky, and as was the case with the English landscape looks so singularly desolate, the desolation of a dearth of human homes, industrial centers, families, workers, and owners of the soil. Few roads, scarce ever a vehicle. No barns, no groups of bright, well-ordered buildings, indeed no farms and neighborhoods and schoolhouses, but a wide spread of rich, highly cultivated country with here and there Visible to close scrutiny, small gray stone houses with thatched roofs, the abodes of poverty and wretchedness. A recent English writer says the first thing that struck him in America, in the American landscape painting, was the absence of man and the domestic animals from the pictures, and the preponderance of rude, wild nature, and his first view of this country seems to have made the same impression. But it is certainly true that the traveler through any of our older states will see ten houses, rural habitations to one in England or Ireland, though as a matter of course nature here looks much less domesticated and much less expressive of human occupancy and contact. <clears throat> the old world people have clung to the soil closer and more lovingly than we do. The ground has been more precious. They have had none to waste and have made the most of every inch of it. Wherever they had touched, they had taken root and thriven as best they could, then the American is more cosmopolitan and less domestic. He is not so local in his feelings and attachments. He does not bestow himself upon the earth or upon his home as his ancestors did. His, he feathers his nest very little. Why should he? He may bit, mitigate tomorrow and build another, he migrate tomorrow and build another, he is like the passenger pigeon that lays its eggs and rears its young upon a little platform of bare twigs. Our poverty and nakedness is in this respect, I think, beyond dispute. There is nothing nest-like about our homes, either in their interiors or exteriors. Even wealth and taste and foreign aids rarely attain that cozy, mellowing atmosphere that pervades not only the lowly birthplaces, but the halls and manor houses of other la older lands. And what do our farms represent but so much real estate, so much cash value? Only where man loves the soil and nestles to it closely and long will it take on this beneficent and human look which foreign travelers miss in our landscape, and only where homes are built with fondness and emotion and in obedience to the social, paternal, and domestic instincts will they hold the charm and radiate and be warm with the feeling I have described. And while I am upon the subject, I will add that European cities differ from ours in the same, in this same particular. They have a homelier character, more the air of dwelling places, the abodes of men drawn together for other purposes than traffic. People actually live in them and find life sweet and festal. But what does our greatest city, New York, express besides commerce or politics? Or what other reason has it for its existence? This is, of course in a measure the result of the modern worldly and practical business spirit which more and more animates all nations and which led Carlyle to say of his own countrymen that they were becoming daily more flat, stupid, and mammon, mammonish. 
Yet I am persuaded that in our case it is traceable also to the leanness and depletion of our social and convivial instincts and to the fact that the material cares of life are more serious and engrossing with us than with any other people. I spent part of a day at court wandering about the town, threading my way through the back streets and alleys and seeing life reduced to fewer makeshifts than I had ever before dreamed of. I went through or rather skirted a kind of second-hand market where the most sorry and dilapidated articles of clothing and household utensils were offered for sale and where the cobblers were cobbling up old shoes that would hardly hold together. Then the wretched old women one sees without any sprinkling of young, young ones, youth and age alike, bloomless and unlovely. In a meadow on the hills that encompassed the city, I found the American dandelion in bloom and some large red clover and started up some skylarks as I might start up the field sparrows in our own uplying fields. Is the magpie a Celt and a Catholic? I saw not one in England, but plenty of them in France and again when I reached Ireland. At Queenstown, I awaited the steamer from Liverpool, and about nine o'clock in the morning was delighted to see her long black form moving up the bay. She came to anchor about a mile or two out, and a little tug was in readiness to take us off. <clears throat> a score or more of emigrants, each with a bag and a box, and had, had been waiting all the morning at the wharf, when the time of embarkation arrived, the agents stepped aboard the tug and called out their names one by one. When Bridget and Catherine and Patrick and Michael and the rest came aboard, received their tickets and paused forward with a half-frightened, half-bewildered look, but not much emotion was displayed until the boat began to move off when the tears fell freely and they continued to fall faster and faster and the sobs to come thicker and thicker until as the faces of friends began to fade on the wharf, both men and women burst out into a loud, unrestrained bawl. This sudden demonstration of grief seemed to frighten the children and smaller fry, who up to this time had been very jovial, but now suspecting something was wrong, they all broke out in a most pitiful chorus, forming an anticlimax to the wail of their parents that was quite amusing, and that seemed to have its effect upon the children of a larger growth for they instantly hushed their lamentations and turned their attention toward the great steamer. There was a rugged but bewildered old granny among them on her way to join her daughter somewhere in the interior of New York who seemed to regard me with a kindred eye and toward whom I confess I felt some family affinity, but before we had got halfway to the vessel, the dear old creature missed a sheet from... <clears throat> her precious bundle of worldly effects and very confidently, confidentially told me that her suspicions pointed to the stoker, a bristling sooty, wild Irishman. The stoker rep resented the insinuation, and I overheard him berating the old lady in Irish so sharply and threateningly, I had no doubt of his guilt that she was quite frightened and ready to retreat the charge to hush the man up. She seemed to think her troubles had just begun. <clears throat> if they behaved thus to her on a little tug, what would they do to her on the board, the great black steamer itself? So when she got separated from her luggage and getting aboard the vessel, her excitement was great, and I met her following about the man whom she had accused of filching her bed linen, as if he must have the clue to the lost bed itself. Her face brightened when she saw me and giving me a terribly hard wink and a most expressive nudge said she wished I would keep near her a little. This I did, and soon had the pleasure of leaving her happy and reassured beside her box and bundle. The passage home, though a rough one, was cheerfully and patiently borne. I found a compound motion, the motion of a screw steamer, a rolling, a plunge, less trying to my head than the simple rocking or pitching of the side-wheeled Scotia. <clears throat> One motion was in a measure a foil to the other. My brain, acted upon by two forces, was compelled to take the hypotenuse, and I think the concussion was considerably diminished thereby. The vessel was forever trembling upon the verge of immense watery chasms that opened now and then under her port bows, now under her starboard, and that almost made one catch for his breath as he looked into them. 
Yet the noble ship had a way of skirting them or striding across them that was quite wonderful. Only five days was I compelled to hole up in my stateroom, hibernating, weathering the final rude shock of the Atlantic. Part of this time I was capable of feeling a languid interest in the oscillations of my coat suspended from a hook in the door. Back and forth, back and forth, all day long vibrated this black pendulum at long intervals, touching the sides of the room, indicating great lateral or diagonal motion of the ship. The great waves, I observed, go in packs like wolves. Now one would pounce upon her, then another, then another in quick succession, making the ship strain every nerve to shake them off. Then she would glide along quietly for some minutes, and my coat would register but a few degrees in its imaginary arc when another band of the careering demons would cross our path and harass us as before. Sometimes they would pound and thump on the sides of the vessel like immense sledgehammers, beginning away up toward the blouse and quickly running down her whole length, jarring, ranking, and venturing their wrath in a very audible manner, or a wave would rake along the side with a sharp, ringing, metallic sound like a huge spear point, seeking a vulnerable place, or some hard-backed monster would rise up from the deep and grate and bump the whole length. Whole length of the keel, forcibly suggesting hidden rocks, a consequent wreck and ruin. Then it seems there is always some biggest wave to be met with somewhere on the voyage, a monster bill that engulfs disabled vessels and sometimes carries away parts of the rigging of the staunchest. This big wave struck us the third day out about midnight and nearly threw us all out of our berths and careered the ship over so far that it seemed to take her last pound of strength to right herself up again. There was a slammer... <laughs> There was a slamming of doors, a rush of crockery, and a screaming of women heard above the general din and confusion while the steerage passengers thought their last hour had come. The vessel before us encountered this giant wave during a storm in mid-ocean and was completely buried beneath it. One of the officers was swept overboard. The engine suddenly stopped and there was a terrible moment during which it seemed uncertain whether the vessel would shake off the sea or go to the bottom. Besides observing the oscillations of my coat, I had at times a stupid satisfaction in seeing my two new London trunks belabor each other about my stateroom floor. Nearly every day they would break from their fastenings under my berth and start on a wild race for the opposite side of the room. Naturally enough, the little trunk would always get the start of the big one, but the big one followed close and sometimes caught the little one in a very uncomfortable manner. Once a knife and a fork and a breakfast plate slipped off the sofa and joined in the race, but if not distance, they got sadly the worst of it, especially the plate. But the carpet had the most reason to, compl to complain. Two or three turns sufficed to loosen it from the floors when, shoved to one side, the two trunks took turns in budding it. I used to allow this sport to go on till it grew monotonous when I grew when I would alternately shout and ring until Robert appeared and restored order. The condition of certain picture frames and vases and other frail articles among my effects when I reached home called to mind not very pleasantly this trunken frolic. It is impossible not to sympathize with the ship in her struggles with the waves. You are lying there wedged in your berth, and she seems indeed a thing of life and conscious power. She is built entirely of iron, is 500 feet long, and besides other freight carries 250 2,500 tons of railroad iron, which lies down there flat in her bottom. A dead, indigestible weight, so unlike a cargo in bulk, yet she is quick in spirit for all that. You feel every wave that strikes her. You feel the sea bearing down her, bearing her down. She has run her nose into one of those huge swells in a solid blue wall of water. Tons and weight comes over her bows and floods her forward deck. She braces herself. Every rod and rivet and timber seems to lend its support. You almost expect to see the wooden walls of your room grow rigid with muscular contraction. She trembles from stem to stern. She recovers. She breaks the grip of the, her antagonist and rising up, shakes the sea from her with a kind of gleeful wrath. I hear that torments of water rush along the lower decks. 
and finding a means of escape, pour back into the sea, glad to get away on any terms. And I, and I say, noble ship, you are indeed a god. I wanted to see a first-class storm at sea and perhaps ought to be satisfied with the heavy blow or hurricane we had when off Sable Island, but I confess I was not, though by the lying to of the vessel and the frequent soundings it was evident there was danger about. A dense fog uprose, which did not drift like a land fog, but was as immovable as iron. It was like a spell, a misty enchantment, and out of this fog came the wind, a steady, booming blast that smote the ship over on her side and held her there, and howled in the rigging like a chorus of fiends. The waves did not know which way to flee. They were heaped up and then scattered in a twinkling. I thought of the terrible line of one of our poets, the spasm of the sky and the shatter of the sea. The sea looked wrinkled and old and old, oh, so pitiless. I stood there long before Turner's shipwreck in the National Gallery in London, and this sea recalled this, his, and I appreciated more than ever the artist's great powers. These storms, it appears, are rotary in their wild dance and promenade up and down the seas. Look the squ wind squarely in the teeth, says an ex-seaman, sea captain, among the passengers, and eight points to the right in the northern hemisphere will be the center of the storm, and eight points to the left in the southern hemisphere. I remembered that in Victor Hugo's terrible dynamics. Storms revolved in the other direction in the northern hemisphere or followed the hands of a watch, while south of the equator they no doubt have ways equal south of the equator they no doubt have ways equally original late in the afternoon the storm abated the fog was suddenly laid and looking towards the setting sun i saw him athwart the wildest most desolate scene in which it was ever my fortune to behold the face of that god the sea was terribly agitated and the endless succession of leaping frothing waves between me and the glowing west formed a picture i shall not soon forget I think the excuse that it is often made in behalf of American literature, namely that our people are too busy with other things yet, and will show their proper aptitude in this field too, as soon as leisure is afforded, is fully justified by events of daily occurrence. Throw a number of them together without anything else to do, and they at once communicate to each other the itch of authorship. Confine them on board an ocean steamer, and by the third or fourth day a large number of them will break out all over with a sort of literary rash that nothing will assuage but some newspaper or journalistic enterprise which will give the poems and essays and jokes with which they are surcharged a chance to be seen and heard of men. I doubt if the like ever occurs among travelers of any other nationality. Englishmen or Frenchmen or Germans want something more warm and human, if less refined, but the average American, when in company, likes nothing so well as an opportunity to show the national trait of smartness. There is not a bit of danger that we shall ever relapse into barbarism while so much latent literature lies at the bottom of our daily cares and avocations and is sure to come to the surface the moment the latter are suspected, suspended or annulled. <clears throat> While abreast of New England, and I do not and don't know how many miles at sea, as I turned in my deck promenade, I distinctly scented the land, a subtle, delicious odor of farms and homesteads, warm and humid, that floated on the wild sea air, a promise and a token. The broad red line that had been so slowly creeping across our chart for so many weary days, indicating the path of the ship, had now completely bridged the chasm and had got a good purchase down under the southern coast of New England, and according to the, rec to the reckoning, we ought to have made Sandy Hook that night, but though the position of the vessel was no doubt theoretically all right, yet practically she proved to be much farther out at sea, for all that afternoon and night she held steadily on her course, and not till next morning did the coast of Long Island, like a thin broken cloud just defined on the horizon, come into view. But before many hours we had past the hook and were moving slowly up the bay in the midday splendor of the powerful and dazzling light of the new world sun and how good things looked to me after even so brief an absence the brilliancy the roominess 
the deep transparent blue of the sea, the clear sharp outlines, the metropolitan splendor of New York, and especially of Broadway, and as I walked up that great thoroughfare and noted the familiar physiognomy and the native nonchalance and independence, I experienced the delight that only the returned traveler can feel, the instant preference of one's own country and countrymen over all the rest of the world.